I can tell your brains are moving. You're thinking about similarities and differences, perceived challenges, which we know is the impetus for change, right? If you can perceive them and work on them. What we're gonna do in this next section is we're gonna drill down a little bit more on what it can look like when you use the multi-tiered systems of supports, AKA PBIS uh, features. And by the way, the terms, are they, I forget, Casey, Jody, they're used interchangeably or do they mean different things in Nevada? I forgot. Okay, so the history of all of this, by the way, is PBIS came out in the late 90s, and it was a multi-tiered system of support, but there were no other multi-tiered systems of support. This is a little history lesson. When the academic multi-tiered systems of support came out about probably six, seven, eight years after PBIS was already underway, they called it RTI. Response to intervention, PBIS and RTI and MTSS all have the same features. Things change, people call them different things. When the academic version of PBIS came out with the name RTI, people were confused and mistakenly thought RTI is academics and PBIS is behavior and they were different things. Actually at the time, RTI should have been the umbrella response to intervention, because anything that's multi-tiered and uses data and increases the interventions is a response to intervention system. And then all of a sudden, everybody decided if they changed it totally to something new, people might understand that they're both the same. So we went from PBIS to RTI to MTSS. And they all have the same core features. It's just like, remember um, mainstreaming? Anybody old enough to remember the regular ed initiative? Then there was inclusion. Then there was full inclusion, right? So sometimes names change as time goes on in an effort to engage more people. I'm not sure. But what we're going to do now is just drill down a little bit of, um, of the same thing, a little deeper level. Again, thinking about your current systems and how could you expand the MTSS features you have to integrate a broader array of supports, right? So let's, let's see, okay, is this, there we go. All right, so the, our fourth key message, the first one was single system of delivery. The second one was uh, beyond access, which I always call access is not enough, but it should say beyond access, outcomes matter, right? The third was mental health is for all. And the fourth key feature that helps us understand what an interconnected system framework looks like is using the core features of MTSS, right? So the key words there are teams who use data, who have a formal process for the selection and the implementation of evidence-based practices through the teams, that we include comprehensive screening, and in this case we wanna make sure it addresses kids with internalizing, as well as externalizing, and that we're progress monitoring with predetermined data points for both fidelity and both effectiveness. And we have this comprehensive professional development to help people make sure that they're at full fidelity by refining their practice over time through ongoing technical assistance, often known as coaching, right? That training is not enough. So those are the features that gave the PBIS implementation efforts across the country in the past 20 years the successes with all the outcomes that we shared earlier. And because they put a structure in place for decision making that relies on data and progress monitors. Okay, so let's, let's kind of drill down a little bit. The formal process for selecting and implementing evidence-based practices, practices there's kind of a standard set of tier one and tier two practices when we all first started learning PBIS, and they're kind of categories of interventions that remain the same, but even within the realm of social skills instruction, 
You have to decide which skills you're going to teach to which kids, and how will you know when they fully learned and integrated the skills. The example I gave you earlier with the trauma-informed or the, or the coping cat. The recommendation always is to not bite off more than you can chew thoroughly and well. Okay? Otherwise, what do you get? You get indigestion, right? You, you also get a little bit of a lot and not effectiveness. So one of the mistakes we see, for example, grant sites make is all of a sudden they want everybody trained in everything yesterday, right? So instead of choosing training, we choose interventions. And remember the stages of implementation? You explore, you decide what to adopt, and you decide what to adopt based on your capacity to install it and implement it well and in a sustainable manner. So that does lead school teams to being careful, we hope, of not doing the kitchen sink approach and instead working off of your data and make sure that you're doing it well. Match to need, culture, and context. Um, as I said earlier, not every school, even in the same school district, needs to have the same uh, trauma-informed skill sets at tier one. It depends on your numbers, right? And so when we see training versus uh, selection and process for installation of interventions, we get nervous when people just talk about, we want everybody trained in this, we want everybody trained in that. Mental health first aid actually is a good example that you guys brought up. The training is good, but you're not confident it's achieved its outcome. Because one shot training does not change people's attitudes and behaviors and actions, right? So that's, that's an excellent example. So you know you need to look at uh, evidence-based practices related to it, and you have to install them with the right resources, the right people, the people with the right background, right? And places have done that, or they've done multi-tiered suicide prevention. I've seen mental health first aid be tier one, and I've seen it be tier two. I'm trying to remember who they, it was California, Mike, uh, Mike Lombardo's district in California. Some people do it as tier one, some people do it as tier two. The point is that you make careful decisions based on your culture, based on your context, based on the capacity and the ability to do it well, right? Again, it's a team process, not individual people making decisions. And that we talked about, there's some perceived barriers to that. And it depends on how structured your system is on how hard the change is going to be. So for example, one school district we're working with in the Midwest, uh, one school, the clinicians are already coming to the teams they already know about check-in, check-out in tier one, and there's a good interaction regularly between the clinicians hired in from the community and the school team. But the point they haven't crossed that will be, they'll get there faster than some of the other schools in the same district. The point they haven't crossed is the decision for interventions being a team process. But they have a good setup for it. Whereas if you're in a building where the clinicians are completely separate, they're handed you know, referrals, they see kids, and people don't really know what they're doing. You're gonna have a longer road to go before you select interventions together. So it kind of depends on where you're at with them. And the interventions linked across the tiers. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So installing foundational interventions school-wide, a lot of you have already done with tier one. Ensuring identification, monitoring, and selection process are in place. Do you have a selection process for which kids go on check-in, check-out, right? So you see, you already have some of these habits but, and some of these procedures and some of these routines. But the question will be, how hard will it be and what do we need to do to bring everything into a similar selection process, right? So for example, if you're looking at trauma-informed interventions, coping cat, check and connect, which is a highly individualized intervention, right? You've got to think about how they'll be linked to the foundation. So a couple more messages on the continuum of intervention. Uh, we just recently posted a technical guide on the integration of SEL into PBIS. It's available. They have, they have it. Oh, you have it? You have it? OK. <laughs> the very efficient technology team, OK? And that may be helpful to some of you. Again, 
you want to be careful on your selection of your SEL skills. Rather than just taking a book, a curriculum, and teach one skill after the next, choose the skills based on the data of your community and your school and integrate them into your matrix with respect, responsibility, and safety. Don't add on, blend in and make decisions based on data. Instead of lesson one, week one, lesson two, week two, again, that is that selection process. Increase support by using check and check out. We're big fans of check and check out as the basic foundation for higher tiered interventions. I believe very strongly that kids on higher tiered interventions should almost always be on check and check out. And you use that as the link back to the classroom and the transition off the higher tiered interventions. And that will force you to find the link between the higher tiered interventions and the dialogue the teacher's having with the kids in the classroom connected to tier one and check and check out. Again, small group instruction on specific skill sets. We see social skill sets, coping skill sets, problem solving, uh, skills as low level generic, high frequency dosage of teaching. It's a full range. And you could have different ranges, I'll show you in a moment, of the same skill set, of, of a continuum within your groups. And could you say what DPR is? daily progress report for the check and check out. I think I have a picture of it coming up, not there, but soon. I showed one earlier. It's got, right, okay, I'll go back to it. But it's, you, you know, the skills are layered into the daily progress report. That's what links them back to tier one. So for ease uh, with the teacher in the classroom and transference and generalization, and as I mentioned earlier, increasing the effectiveness of the intervention. Small group in instruction. We use our screening data, other data, referral data. Here's another example of a social emotional skill linked right into the tier one at the classroom level, right? Respect, use your words, use safe hands, uh, safety, self check, use calming strategies. Does every school need to have those in tier one? Probably not. Do any of you know schools that have a high enough incidence of certain data points that it would be good to be teaching those right at tier one, right? Okay, so this is the kind of, this is what we mean by selection of evidence-based practice. The evidence-based practice is the teaching of the skills to everybody, right? The selection is which skills based on which data points that we want to move. And linking them back to the expectations and teaching them in the natural location is, is always the big winner, always the one you want to go for. Now the database process, every intervention that you have that is beyond tier one, you want to have identification for who gets in. Once they're in it, the intervention, let's say coping cat or some other trauma-informed intervention, before the intervention begins, you have to decide how you're going to know if it works, not after. We find that the higher tiered interventions and the more, quote, mental health interventions historically have the least amount of evaluation predetermined and attached to them. So we got to be pretty careful to make sure that we use the MTS features. How long are they going to be on it? What's the dosage? What's the frequency? Are we going to use the daily progress report? Are we, like with the... Uh, Coping cat, that scared survey, you know, what are the data points? What's the frequency? What's the time frame? And the mental health interventions, again, use your data for your selection process. And here is some of the, this is about our fourth slide of the different types of community data that could be used. We're doing this on purpose, by the way, because you know the one shot, you're like, where's that slide with community data? There's probably four of them uh, in here. This is an example of people using different data sets. So you have the names of the kids. This is all fake. You have the grade level, time out of class, major behavioral referrals, possible motivation, that comes from the office discipline referral form, and grades, attendance, and their check and check out. And that could be an example of thinking about kids who might need a higher tiered intervention, like the triangulating of different sets of data. This is uh, one of our newer and 
we're, we're, we're very excited about this discussion. It took us a while to get comfortable with it and try to figure out our messages. And then, of course, there's the making of the visual. But I mentioned to you earlier in response to possibly Jake's question or comment, I can't remember where, but I already talked to you about the fact that there could be a continuum of groups on the same skill set. The example I used was trauma-informed. If you have kids who are in active trauma, you can't teach them the skills if they're not open to the instruction when they get there because they're usually in active fight, flight, or freeze responses. So in that higher tiered group for trauma, the group might always begin with the emotional barometer where kids are taught in the first lesson of the eight week group or whatever it is, how to give themselves an emotional barometer rating. Are you a one, are you a two, are you a three or a four at this moment when you come in? And then there may also be a mindfulness activity to help them get rid of whatever makes them feel like they're a four at the moment. What you're basically doing is adding techniques to the intervention based on the data of the kids, because before you can teach and practice the skills, we've got to kind of clear their heads and get them ready for focusing on the skills. Whereas if you just launched right into the skill instruction, they wouldn't be ready for it. Does that make sense to you? And if you just have kids who are at risk because of their demographic factors across the neighborhood, you might, in the, that instruction, whether it's tier one or tier two, you, you might not necessarily need the emotional barometer or the mindfulness activity. The point is to make choices based on data and likelihood of impact, right? You never want to do more than you need to do to accomplish the instructional purpose, to accomplish the change. So the, this is an example of you know, the social behavior core curriculum. And notice, oh, here, let me use, I'm using my finger when it would be much better to do this, OK? <laughs> taught by the teacher daily to all students. And over here, we have taught by staff with advanced technical skills. You get the idea? So you're, you have to think about what is this, the uh, complexity of the intervention matched to the data point of the kids, and who do we have that can do it? which was back to the coping cat example and the dialogue with Jake around certain people thinking that the school psychologist might be outside of their bounds teaching coping cat. But what I was excited to report to you is the school psychologist was actually the one who found the intervention in the literature, studied it, and brought it back to the group. And one of their decision points was, we can do this. It doesn't require extensive amounts of certification and training and whatnot. It's similar to other things that we were doing. So their selection process uh, put them into all the dialogue. Who, when, what, right? And how are we going to know if it works? So this is an important thing to think about as you expand your continuum is certain skill groups for kids with certain uh, mental health issues and struggles or behaviors could be done on a continuum. And you could have more than one version of them on the lower end or on the higher end. And that's where your dialogue about who has the comfort level and the skill set works. A lot of, uh, this is an example of this, how are you feeling today, youth self-report, right? This gets included in some of the groups because one of the skill sets is recognizing when you need to use your coping skills, right? So these are just some examples from different curriculum. Now we're back to the DPR, the Daily Progress Report. This is a different example. We tend to put more than one example on the card. You would probably only have one of these with certain kids. Uh, it'd be unlikely that you would do all three skills until the group was near its end, for example. And then you might have a series of skills. But the real power here is connecting the skill set back to the classroom. This is a key feature of MTSSRTIPBIS, whatever you want to call it. A key feature, remember that triangle I showed you in the beginning? Everything's green and you add on and it's linked. It's not completely separate happening over here. And we think the check in, check out daily progress report is a wonderful tool to keep things simple, keep things layered, and to bring the teacher into, quite frankly, the most powerful role of the intervention 
is in the natural environment. And so if it links to the dialogue that they're already having, and it's linked to a skill set, we're thinking and we're getting feedback, the feeling of confidence and competency on the part of the teacher in terms of reinforcing the intervention increases when it's layered for them. All right, this is an example here where we're, we're even going up to tier three and connecting tier three, a kid's function-based behavior plan with their replacement behavior in different ways back down to tier one. Because the teacher doesn't have to remember, oh, who's on what plan, the check in, check out, if they're already used to it, if, if they understand it's about positive contact, that will be helpful for them. Uh, here's another one with an FBA plan. So there's lots of examples in there. Hopefully one of them sticks with you to help you remember this, okay? We want to talk about the teaming aspect of MTSS for a moment, all right? So this is a, a confusing looking slide. Uh, we developed this in Illinois through a tier two, tier three grant we had from the, uh, from the Federal Department of Education years ago to establish structures for tier two, tier three. Matter of fact, a lot of the work we're doing in ISF comes out of that, including the layered DPR. So this teaming process should look like the teams in your building, but let's check a little bit. Think about the teams in your building and how the teams function. So for example, the tier one team should never talk about individual kits. It should talk about the entire data set. Now you're gonna bring with this interconnected system frame, whoops, framework work, sorry, you're gonna bring different people onto the team, all right? And we highly recommend the TIPS process. Are you guys into the TIPS process? No, that's something to look at in terms of, it's just a real structured, organized way to run meetings. But the point is you need structured, organized, same agenda, ways to run meetings. And if your meeting structure isn't really clean and you're bringing new people in, sometimes you like to clean the house before you invite new people to live with you, right? Okay, so that often needs to happen. Now the secondary team over here is talking about how many kids are on check in, check out, and how many, do we have daily progress reports for it? How many are uh, 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 progressing on it? How many kids are in different social academic instructional groups? And how many groups do we have going? And we report out on each group. And how many of the kids in the group also have an individual feature? And we think these three categories of interventions can be discussed in the tier two systems meeting. Now you really should not be talking about individual kids there either. You know, we have eight kids in the coping group. We just finished it. We just did a uh, time two of the scared survey. Here's the data on it. We have two kids that we think, we've had them in individualized add-on support for the coping skills, but we think that they're gonna need more. Right? So you talk about the systems. Now, having family members and community members on these teams shouldn't be an issue because you're not talking about individual kids. But if you haven't shifted to system meetings and system discussions, the question comes up, oh, we can't have a family representative on there because we're talking about kids. Well, you're not having the right type of meeting then. You need to like address your system discussions at the meetings. Now, when the community and family members are on the teams, there's often a different type of dialogue. One of my favorite early on with this, and it wasn't even mental health, it was just with family involvement. We had a district where their goal was to get family members on every one of the teams. I was working with them, one of our larger districts in Illinois. And one of the stories that came back to the district meeting from one of the teams is they were having a discussion. It was one of those schools that had uniforms. Uh, I, we won't get into all that dialogue, but they had this uniform thing. And certain of the girls, I think it was like seventh grade, were getting all these violations for not wearing the proper uniforms. And the mom on the team says, you know, these girls don't like the way they look in those shirts. And it changed the entire dialogue from what do we do about rule violation to what's going on here. She was talking about girls who had weight issues, some of the shirts were too tight. I can't even remember what the issue was, but it changed the conversation. 
Just like having a community member on that team in central Illinois when they were struggling with all the data around the kids who weren't responding to check and check out, she said, you know, that data sounds like what we just got trained in as trauma. Do you think these, and she shared what she knew about that, and they had a different discussion. And that was 10 years ago before schools were talking that much about trauma. So having different people on the team can open up for a greater array of ways to address data points. So that's, that's the main premise of ISF, but we're using the MTSS feature of organized discussions around teams. Now in our particular model, and you may or may not go this route, we have an intermediate between the dark yellow and the red team, which is a problem solving team where you do do what we call quick, brief, simple FBA BIP for, uh, and you have a generic problem solving team and a different teacher, kid and family might come in and out and it's like the 15, 20 minute FBA BIP discussion. You would not have other family members on that team, right? But when you get to tier three, we're back to a systems team. This is really hard. I've done a lot of tier three work and what's really hard for people is to have a system tier three discussion because they want to talk about each and every kid who's on a tier three intervention. And what we have to remind people is a tier three intervention, part of it, the key feature, is each kid has their own team. So the systems team is not there to second guess the wraparound team or the FBA BIT team. It's there to say, how many kids do we have on wraparound plans and how many are doing well? Well, we've got 12 kids on wrap plans and their total suspension rate went from whatever, 42 down to 16, but we have two kids that are mostly those 16. And we, what sort of technical support can we give their wraparound team to do a function-based behavior plan around that suspension data? You get the idea, All right? So the system team can have the family and the community members and have this type of dialogue. Now, the, one of the questions we have for you at this point is, what is your teaming structure like? We have found that some schools had a teaming structure long before they had PBIS, and it was either called SST, ABC, XYZ, you know, and every week there'd be a roster of kids, and we'd go through the roster of kids. What we found is they, as they adopted into a PBIS system, some of the schools kept those old teams. And those were actually those teams to see who got into special ed and who didn't. I mean, that was the origination of a lot of those teams. So if you're thinking about moving forward with bringing different people on your teams, the first thing we would ask you to do is think about your current teaming structure and maybe where it might need to be tweaked relative to bringing different people on it. I'm gonna skip that for a minute, Kelly, and go to this one. So just take a, we're just gonna give you just a couple minutes here, two minute discussion. What teams already exist in your building to discuss kids' behavior concerns? And more importantly, how are decisions made? 